Um, the scripture this morning, if you want to follow along in your, in your Bibles or up on the screen, first scripture is going to be from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. And it says this, For there will never cease to be poor people in the land. That is why I'm commanding you, you must willingly open your hands to your afflicted and poor brothers in your land. Very important passage to remember as we talk about today, getting on stuck, that we're always going to have the afflicted and the poor with us, and we have to willingly open our hands to our brothers. Next one is from John 15, 12 through 17. Um, very familiar passage to most of us. And this is where Jesus is speaking. He says this, This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than someone would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you slaves anymore, because you, a slave does not know what, what, the, what his master is doing. I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit, and that your fruit should remain. So that what, whatever you ask, the Father in my name, he will give you. This is what I've commanded you. Love one another. And then continuing on with our scripture reading in James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, reads as follows. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in the mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, and is not forgetful, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. So as we wrap up our Unstuck series that's been going on the last, this is the fourth week, we kind of took a break last week with uh, Back to Church Sunday. Um, but I want to talk about the things. The first week we talked about was the unimaginable. When bad things happen and we don't understand, how do we react? All right, then it was uh, the unsafe. You know, there's circum circumstances in this world that are not safe. And there's times where God's going to call us out of our comfort and our safety zones of life to do his work and we have to be prepared to walk in the unsafe. Um, last week would have been, and we talked about it on Wednesday, would have been the, the unwanted, right? There is a price for following Jesus Christ. For many people in this room who I know and love, that price has been the loss of friendships. It's been, um, you know, struggles between parents or brothers and sisters. There's a, there's a cost, and we live in a society that really, as Christians, it seems like we're not wanted in many arenas today. Which leads us to, with all these things piling up for us, how do we get unstuck? We've all heard the common definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Okay? Um, I watched just a classic video on this the other day. This basketball player was, couldn't figure out why he could not make a three-point shot. And He'd go and he'd, he said, I, I take a thousand jump shots a day, and I still can't not make a three-pointer. Out of his thousand jump shots, how many do you suppose he sh took from behind the three-point line? Ten. <laughs> so every day he takes ten three-pointers, and then a thousand, or nine hundred and ninety other shots, and he can't figure out why the results are the exact same. That's insanity. He's doing the exact same thing every single day and expecting a different result. As Christians, I think we've fallen into this trap. We fall into this trap as Christians because we, we just read our Bibles. We say, you know what? I read my Bible every single day, and I'm not, I don't see any change going on in my life. And so I just, I'm going to read again and again and again, and there's no change. And we say, we're, we're kind of in this rut or thanks to the movie War Room, many Christians have been called to a season of prayer in our lives. And we pray and we pray and we pray and we say, I, don't, I just don't feel alive. What's happening? Why is this going on? 
And again, going back to that definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. Probably my favorite is I go to church every Sunday, or almost every Sunday, and I just don't see changes in my life. We find ourselves stuck in a rut. And I, I love um, a commonly used description of what a, a, a rut is. And I'm going to read this, make sure I get it right. A rut is a grave that has the two ends kicked out, and we're just stuck there, right? I've heard many Christians in today's culture say things like this. I feel like I'm existing and not living. I feel like I'm numb to the world. I don't see God moving in my life. I don't feel God moving in my life. We are stuck as Christians. And I, I want to read James 1, 22 through 25 one more time, because this is, this is the, how we get out of a rut right here. Do you know when you're ADD and something like that happens, there is a million thoughts going through my mind right now? Um, that's awesome. So James, <laughs> James says this, But be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourself. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in the mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not forgetful, and is not a forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Let's, let's just kind of break this down a little bit. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> let's, when, we, when we look at this word, let's look at this. First thing it says is being doers of the word. All right, this is a call to action. And I believe with my entire being that the church universal for the last 25 to 50 years has forgot to be doers of the word. It's called action. Last week I talked about how we have produced generations of consumers in church. We go to church for us. What do I get out of church? Um, those type of things. We come to church for us. And, and James continues this thought. He's like, you know, this... This can't be like this. We need to be doers of the word. Not only hearers, because you deceive yourself. If we are to get unstuck, it has to start with our attitude towards church and our attitude towards our Lord. Right? God has called us to be his hands and feet. And I love what Francis Chan said in the book Multiply when he said, the message of the Great Commission was such an important message for us to go out and make disciples that Jesus came back from the dead to deliver that message to us. That's how important that is, that we are doers of the word. James goes on to say, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man looking at his own face in the mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. I think this sums up many Christians in the world today. We are so excited about Christ when we made that decision and it was fresh and it was new and we've grown in our faith and then we forget what that's like. Right? We forget the transformation that took place in our lives that moment that we, we confessed Christ as Lord and Savior and he literally pulled us from hell over to heaven. That's the miracle of salvation. And if we, don't, if we lose that, that excitement, we forget whose we are more importantly than who we are. We have become consumer Christians. We don't even recognize ourselves. It is amazing to me how many times when I read blogs about, from Christians, it's all about what we're against in this world. And yeah, there's some, there's some downright evil in this world today. I'm not gonna, that's a whole different conversation. But let's talk about what we're for. What did Jesus say? Love one another, take care of the poor, the widows, the orphans. But when we don't even recognize ourselves, that's what, that's what leads us to phrases like, I feel like I'm just existing. I'm numb. I don't feel God in my life. That comes from us being stuffed with the Word of God. Okay? How many of you have ever, maybe at Thanksgiving, ate way too much turkey dressing and mashed potatoes? Good, I'm not the only one. All right? And how hard is it to, like, move afterwards? I remember a couple years ago, we got to eat this huge meal, and, and I, I was really thought like, there was a, a turkey wing sticking out of my stomach over here, you know, and, and someone has this great idea, let's go for a walk. It was miserable, right? That same thing happens to us as Christians. 
We can get so filled with God's word that we never get it out of us that it's just, it's just there all the time. And that's kind of how we get to these feelings. We never let the living water of God flow out of us. We've kind of become selfish with God a little bit. We just want God for us, and, and that's not how it works. God called us to, to pour out into the lives of other people. So really, instead of living water, the water and spirit inside of us has become stagnant slew water. James goes on to say this, but the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it is not forgetful here, but one who does good works. See, in order for us to become unstuck, we need to study the word, pray, and go to church with a different attitude. And that attitude needs to be, God, what are you teaching me today so I can influence the world with? God, what are you teaching me today so I can be a better father, so I can be a better husband, so I can be a better pastor, so I can be a better, uh, you know, truck driver, whatever your profession is, judge, lawyer, doctor, school teacher. That's what the Word of God does. It changes us and realigns us with his presence and his influence in our lives. What if we had a mindset of I'm studying, praying, and worshiping so I'm equipped to go and pour it out into the world around me? What if we just for one second decided, you know what? This God inside of me is not meant to be kept. Uh, during the countdown this morning, there was a song. I don't even know what song it was playing, but the word said, God is not a secret to be kept. Right? And I know the Newsboys did a song titled that back in like 1990 or whatever. But we tend to do this as Christians is we want to consume God and not share him with the world. And that leads us to this rut of being stuck. What happens if we accepted the challenge of God to be great commissioned people? To be game changers? To influence our culture with the message of Jesus Christ instead of letting the culture influence our view of Jesus Christ? That's what we're talking about is getting unstuck. So how do we do that? How do we accomplish it? How do we become unstuck? The first point of application is it's not about us. I can't help but think about it. Every time I think of that phrase, I think back to the purpose-driven life. The very first line in that book was, it is not about you. And I remember reading that and thought, what a simple concept that's going to change the world. And it has. I mean, it, that book has, has done amazing, God has used it to do amazing things. And there's actually a movie coming out about the situation where the lady, where the lady uh, was held captive and she just kept reading Purpose Driven Life to her captor, to her, to the one who had captured her. And um, I encourage you to check that movie out when it comes. I think, I think the actual name of it is Captive, if I'm right. Yes. Thank you all for nodding at me. But so it's not about us. That's every aspect of life. It can't be about our church. And I love our church. I love y'all. I love Cornerstone. I love everything we stand for and all that we're trying to do. But it can't even be about our church. If we don't influence our culture with the message of Jesus Christ, the church is just a club, right? See, the difference between a club and the church, in my opinion, is the church has been given a mission. And that mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. If we continue the current trend in America, and I know eight years ago when I shared a statistic from Ron Lewis that said this current generation, only 4% will attend church, and everyone thought I was crazy, and then we start looking around, and that trend has continued. And right now, the current generation, ab about 4% of this generation attends church. Which tells me that we are two or maybe three generations away from not having church in America. Right? Now, I'm not saying we don't have God, but I'm saying church. Because it takes certain things to have a church. And first and foremost, it takes people. Right? That's what the church is. The building, that's part of it. But it takes people. And if we're only at 4% of our current generation that goes, two to three generations from now, we're in trouble, right? This is what we have to do to get unstuck. Jesus says it in Luke 14, 26 through 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and own mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Okay, again, this is not Jesus saying family is bad, right? I'm, I'm sick of hearing that scripture twisted that way. What Jesus is saying is like, look, I need to be number one. 
It has to be about me. It can't be about you. It can't be about your family. It can't be about your church. It has to be Jesus Christ first and foremost. When I think of family, because Jesus is really calling out, are we prepared to lose our family and our own selves? When I think of family, I think of security and comfort. Family makes me feel good. Um, many of you all have questioned me about a water fight that broke out in my house this weekend. Yes, that's part of family life. And it's fun, and it's safe, and it's comfortable. What Jesus is saying here is we must be prepared to be uncomfortable, to be unsafe. May even may be even unwanted by others for the sake of the cross. He will always be st- we will always be stuck in a rut if we make life about us. Okay? I want, to, I want to reiterate it. If we make life about us, we will always be stuck in a rut. Okay? Because that's how it is. It's one thing singular focused. So how do we combat, how do we combat that? Simply by serving others. Okay? Such a simple concept to say we need to serve others. Yet it's probably the number one challenge that we see in churches today. Our church, like every other church in the world, statistically... 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And that's every nonprofit organization I've ever talked to will say they have the same issue, right? So we need to serve others. The fastest way to get unstuck and find purpose in your life is to serve others. How can you do that? Soup kitchen. We're always looking for volunteers in the soup kitchen. You know, that's a ministry right here in our own church that we struggle with. The Lord's cupboard. Uh, if you've noticed... Lots of news reports lately, the, the number of homeless in mind it is increasing, which also means the amount of food going on the Lord's cupboard, which is the city food pantry is increasing. Um, that those places always need help. Many other min- new ministries that are popping up, you know, um, all over our church and around the city. How about just simply entertaining new people at your house? This one is something that's just, I love. I love being around people. I love hanging out with folks. But what can happen, though, is even if we always hang out with the exact same people, that people group becomes a rut, and we're stuck in a rut. What about entertaining new people, new friends, being bold and inviting someone new to church, being bold and inviting that that new coworker out to dinner with you and your family, those type of things. Basically, what I'm saying is we need to get to the point, if we're going to get unstuck, that we are pouring out the living water of God into other people. Because that's when people come alive. Right? There's, there's that quote that says, don't ask what the world needs, instead ask what makes you come alive, because what the world needs is more people alive. You know, one, probably one of my biggest areas that I love to serve, and I wish we could get more people to serve in, is coaching children's sports in the city through the rec department. I find it very sad that we can have 300 kids going on for a sport, and we don't have enough coaches. There's nothing more rewarding than coaching little kids. And when they, they finally get it, I'm going to just share the story. I, I, I'm coaching rec soccer right now, as you guys have probably all heard. And we have a girl who has never even got a shot on goal until yesterday. And, and yesterday she, she put in her first goal. And I don't know if you guys ever seen the Powerpuff Girls. You remember their eyes were huge? Like this girl just looked over at us like, holy cows, I did it. There, I wouldn't change that moment for much of anything in my life. Just to see this kid, man, growing and being excited and all that kind of stuff. There's places all over the place where we can influence the culture with our love and with our grace. Psalms 23, 5 says this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. If our cup does not overflow with purpose, we're just kind of sucking it all in. That's what I've been talking about most of the morning here. Right? We try to bottle up the Holy Spirit. We want to keep the Holy Spirit for ourselves. The problem is that's, that's our plan, not God's plan. The only way to get unstuck that I know of is, is, and to have proper perspective in, in our lives is the word joy. All right? And this is, this is an acronym. I love this. Uh, J, you know, I'm just going to spell the word joy for us. J is Jesus first. Right? First priority in our lives must be Jesus Christ and about doing the Father's business. Okay? The O is others. So it's Jesus first, others second. Serving other people. That's, that's God's design for us. And the why would obviously be for yourself third. All right, so Jesus first, others second, yourself third. If you want joy in your life and to get out of the rut you're in, make that, that principle right there key in your life. 
The third thing we need to do is walk in mercy. The hardest part about serving other people is not judging folks. Um, it is very difficult at times to love people. <laughs> there are some people that are even harder to love than others, right? We all know this. But not judging them, instead walking in mercy. And, and it's so important that we remember that, you know, before Christ, before Christ in my life, how different was I then, right? When I think about Steve Oster before BC, before Christ, it's a whole different ball game than where I'm at now, right? And sometimes as Christians, we forget that, that mercy and that grace that God showed to us has been a process over several years, and we think that because someone's at church or because someone came to a Bible study or a prayer meeting that they should have their life figured out the way we do. We have no idea where they're at in that journey. So walk in mercy. We must remember we were, we were all sinners. We are all recipients of God's grace and God's mercy. And what I mean by this is really summed up in, in Micah 6, 8. It says this, He has told you what is good and what, is the, what, is, what it is the Lord requires of you. Here it is. Act justly, to love faithfulness, to walk humbly with your God. All right? Being doers of the words is how James says that exact same thing. Not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Can you, it can be summed up like this, act justly. Just quick, definite dic dictionary references here. Act justly. Justly means honestly and fair. Do we treat everyone honestly and fair? Okay? Regardless of what they've done to us, I mean, we can't worry about other people. There's only two things you control in life, your attitude and your effort. It's my effort and my attitude that I'm going to justly and fairly treat people. To love faithfulness. Faithfulness is defined in the dictionary as this, true to one's words, promises, and vows. As Christians, do we live up to that standard? Do I live up to the promises and to the, to the vows and to my word that I've given other people? Right, because we all know the world thinks of every Christian as a hypocrite, right? And if we don't do these things, we're pouring gasoline on that fire a little bit here, right? And the third thing is to be humble. And I, I love the definition of, of of humility, which is being humble is not thinking less about, or not thinking about, not thinking less about yourself, but thinking of yourself less, right? Putting the needs of others first. As the praise team comes forward, let's, let's recap here. The first point was, it's not about us. When we focus on us, we create an even deeper rut, you know? Um, how many of you guys have ever maybe yourselves or been around someone who's kind of stuck in a pity party? And you try and help them, and all they do is keep digging that rut deeper and deeper. Well, you don't understand. You don't, and, and they really don't want to get out of there because they're kind of enjoying the attention, right? It's not about us. Serving others. That really, serving others can be summed up as putting number one into action. It's not about us. We're going to take care of other folks. And to walk in mercy. Demonstrate the grace and mercy of Christ to the world around us. That's what the world needs right now. Is they need someone who's going to say, you know what, I'm going to love on you regardless of circumstances. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love on you regardless of what you've done. I'm going to love on you regardless of how I feel today because that's what my God's called me to do. Is to